Yiddish theater consists of plays written and performed primarily by Jews in Yiddish, the language of the Central European Ashkenazi Jewish community. The range of Yiddish theater is broad, operetta, musical comedy, and satiric or nostalgic reviews, melodrama, naturalist drama, expressionist and modernist plays. At its height, its geographical scope was comparably broad. From the late 19th century until just before World War II, professional Yiddish theater could be found throughout the heavily Jewish areas of Eastern and East Central Europe, but also in Berlin, London, Paris, Buenos Aires, and New York City. Yiddish theater's roots include the often satiric plays traditionally performed during religious holiday of Purim, known as Purim Spiels, other masquerades such as the Dance of Death, the singing of cantors in the synagogues, Jewish secular song and dramatic improvisation, exposure to the theater traditions of various European countries, and the Jewish literary culture that had grown in the wake of the Jewish Enlightenment Hiskala. Israel Berkovici wrote that it is through Yiddish theater that Jewish culture entered in dialogue with the outside world, both by putting itself on display and by importing theatrical pieces from other cultures. Themes such as immigration, assimilation, and poverty can be found in many Yiddish theater productions. Topic: <laughs> Sources in traditional Jewish culture. Topic. Noah Prylutsky noted that Yiddish theatre did not arise simultaneously with theatre in other European national languages. He conjectured that this was at least in part because the Jewish sense of nationality favoured Hebrew over Yiddish as a national language, but few Jews of the period were actually comfortable using Hebrew outside of a religious, liturgical context. Nonetheless, various types of performances, including those of cantors, preachers, jesters, and instrumental musicians, were a part of Eastern European Jewish life long before the formal advent of Yiddish theatre. Berkovici suggests that, as with ancient Greek drama, elements of dramatic performance arose in Jewish life as an artistic refinement of religious practice. He highlights references in the Bible to dance, music, or song, especially in the Psalms, Hebrew to Helam, or songs of praise, where some of the headings refer to musical instruments, or to singing in dialogue, either between parts of the choir, or between the choir and the leader of the ritual Hebrew Also, traditional dances were associated with certain holidays, such as Sukkot, Purim plays, the skits performed by amateur companies around the time of the Purim holiday, were a significant early form of theatrical expression. Often satiric and topical, Purim plays were traditionally performed in the courtyard of the synagogue, because they were considered too profane to be performed inside the building. These made heavy use of masks and other theatrical devices, the masquerade and the singing and dancing generally extended to the whole congregation, not just a small set of players. While many Purim plays told the story in the Book of Esther commemorated by the Purim holiday, others used other stories from Jewish scripture, such as the story of Joseph sold by his brothers or the sacrifice of Isaac. Over time, these well-known stories became less a subject matter than a pretext for topical and satiric theater. Mordecai became a standard role for a clown. Purim plays were published as early as the early 18th century. At least eight Purim plays were published between 1708 and 1720. Most of these do not survive, at least some were burned in autos da fe, but one survives in the Judisch Merkwardekaten, a collection by Johann Jakob Schutt, another similar current in Jewish culture was a tradition of masked dancers performing after weddings. The most elaborate form of this was the Dance of Death, a pageant depicting all layers of a society, which had originated among Sephardic Jews in Spain in the 14th century and had spread through Europe among both Jews and Gentiles. 16th century Italian Jews had taken music and dance to an even more refined level of art. At that time in Italy, there were Jewish virtuosi and dancing masters in Mantua, Ferrara, and Rome, and the first known troops of Jewish performers in Europe. Less refined versions of the same also occurred in 18th century Germany. Additionally, there was a rich tradition of dialogues in the Jewish poetry known as Takamoni, dating back at least to Yehuda al Harizi in 12th century Spain. Al Harizi's work contained dialogues between believer and heretic, man and wife, day and night, land and ocean, wisdom and foolishness, avarice and generosity. Such dialogues figured prominently in early Yiddish theatre. The origin of theatre in Christian societies in Europe is often traced to passion plays and other religious pageants, similar in some ways to the Purim plays. 
In the Middle Ages, few Jews would have seen these, they were often performed in the courtyards of Christian churches few of which were near the Jewish ghettos, on Christian holidays, and they often had significant anti-Semitic elements in their plots and dialogue. However, in later times, the Romanian Orthodox Christmas tradition of Irazi minstrel shows centered around the figure of Herod the Great Ram, Irod, which were the origin of Romanian language theatre definitely influenced Purim plays and vice versa. Jews had far more exposure to secular European theatre once that developed. Meistersinger Hans Sachs' many plays on Old Testament topics were widely admired by the Jews of the German ghettos, and from the 16th century through the 18th, the biblical story of Esther was the most popular theatrical theme in Christian Europe, often under the Latin name Acta Ahasuerus. <laughs> Early years pre Professional Yiddish theatre is generally dated from 1876, although there is scattered evidence of earlier efforts. Besides some 19 amateur Yiddish language theatrical troops in and around Warsaw in the 1830s, there was also, according to one contemporary source, a professional company that in 1838 performed before a receptive audience of both Jews and Gentiles a five act drama Moses, by a certain A. Schertz Spirer of Vienna, with well-drawn characters and good dramatic situations and language." The same source relates that this theater had among its patrons a number of Russian military officers, including one general who was considered a «protector» of it, a circumstance that suggests the difficulties it faced. Around the same time, there are indications of a traveling Yiddish-language theater troupe in Galicia, organized along the lines of an English or Italian theater troupe. In 1854, two rabbinical students from Zytomer put on a play in Berdichev. Shortly afterward, the Ukrainian Jew Abraham Goldfaden, generally considered the founder of the first professional Yiddish theater troupe, attended that same rabbinical school, and while there is known to have played in 1862 a woman's role in a play, Sir Kelle, by Solomon Ettinger. Shortly after that 1869, according to one source, Goldfaden wrote a dialogue Svi Shkane's Two Neighbors, apparently intended for the stage, and published with moderate success. A short-lived Yiddish theatre in Odessa in 1864 performed dramas Esther and Athalia. Abraham Baer Gottlieber's Dectic, like Ettinger. S. Sir Kelle, was written between 1830 and 1840, but published much later. Israel Axenfeld died c. 1868 wrote several dramas in Yiddish, which were probably not staged in his lifetime. Another early Yiddish dramatist was Joel Bear Falkovich, Reb Chimele der Kozen, Odessa, 1866, Rochelle die Singuren, Zytomer, 1868. Solomon Jacob Abramowicz. S. Ditaxi 1869 has the form of a drama, but, like Eliakim Zunzer. S. Later Mekarat Yosef Vilnius, 1893, it was not intended for the stage. Hirsch Lieb Siegetter wrote satirical Purim plays on an annual basis and hired boys to play in them. Although often objected to by rabbis, these plays were popular, and were performed not only on Purim but for as much as a week afterwards in various locations. Another current that led equally to professional Yiddish theatre was a tradition resembling that of the troubadours or minnesanger, apparently growing out of the music associated with Jewish weddings, and often involving singers who also functioned as cantors in synagogues. The first records of the early Brodersinger or Broders singers are the remarks of Jews passing through Brody, which was on a major route of travel, generally disapproving of the singing of songs when no particular occasion called for music. The most famous of the singers from Brody was the itinerant Burl Margulis (1815–1868), known as Burl Broder, Burl from Brody. Twenty-four of his thirty surviving songs are in the form of dialogues. Another influential performer in this style was Benjamin Wolf Ehrenkrantz (1826–1883), known as Velvel Zabarher. Berkovici describes his work as mini melodramas in song. Such performers, who performed at weddings, in the salons of the wealthy, in the summer gardens, and in other secular gathering places of the Eastern European Jews, were not mere singers. They often used costumes and often improvised spoken material between songs, especially when working in groups. Israel Grodner, later Goldfaden's first actor, participated in an outdoor concert in Odessa in 1873 with dialogues between songs comparable to much of what was in Goldfaden's earliest plays. 
Goldfaden himself was already a noted poet, and many of his poems had been set to music and had become popular songs, some of which were used in that 1873 performance. Finally, around this time Yiddish was establishing itself as a literary language, and some Jews with secular interests were familiar with the dominant theatrical traditions of their respective countries. Given this burgeoning literary intellectual culture, within a year or two of Goldfaden's founding the first professional Yiddish theater troupe, there were multiple troupes, multiple playwrights, and more than a a few serious Yiddish theater critics and theoreticians. Topic: <inaudible> Goldfaden and the birth of Yiddish theater in Romania. Topic: Abraham Goldfaden is generally considered the founder of the first professional Yiddish theater troupe, which he founded in Iași, Romania, in 1876, and later moved to Bucharest. His own career also took him to Imperial Russia, LVOV, and New York City. Within two years of Goldfaden's founding of his troupe, there were several rival troops in Bucharest, mostly founded by former members of Goldfaden's troupe. Most of these troops followed Goldfaden's original formula of musical vaudeville and light comedy, while Goldfaden himself turned more toward relatively serious operettas about biblical and historical subjects, especially after his own company left Bucharest for an extended tour of the cities of Imperial Russia. Goldfaden S troop began as all male while they soon acquired actresses as well it remained relatively common in yiddish theater for female roles especially comic roles to be played by men women also sometimes played men s roles molly picone was a famous schmendrick many early yiddish theater pieces were constructed around a very standard set of roles a prima donna a soubrette a comic a lover a villain a villainess or Intriguer. An older man and woman for character roles, and one or two more for spares as the plot might require. And a musical component that might range from a single fiddler to an orchestra. This was very convenient for a repertory company, especially a traveling one. Both at the start and well into the great years of Yiddish theater, the troops were often in one or another degree family affairs, with a husband, wife, and often their offspring playing in the same troupe. At its high end, early Yiddish theater was noted for its pageantry. A pageant about the coronation of Solomon, presented on the occasion of the 1881 coronation of Carol I of Romania was described by Ion Gika as, "...among the most imposing things that paraded the coronation." He acquired the costumes for the Romanian National Theater, which he headed at the time. Both the nature and aspirations of early professional Yiddish theater are reflected in Moses Schwarzfeld. 1877 remarks calling for serious and educational Jewish theater, if we write only comedies or if we only imitate German, Romanian and French pieces translated into Yiddish, all we will have is a secondary Jewish stage. Just making people laugh and cry is an evil for us Jews in Romania. Goldfaden himself agreed with such sentiments. Later, recalling his views at the time, he wrote, If I have arrived at having a stage, I want it to be a school for you. Laugh heartily if I amuse you with my jokes, while I, watching you, feel my heart crying. Then, brothers, I. LL give you a drama, a tragedy drawn from life, and you shall also cry while my heart shall be glad. B. Nathanson, correspondent of the Warsaw-based Jewish newspaper Hamlets visited Romania in the summer of 1878 and wrote, When a Jew enters a Yiddish theater in Bucharest he is thunderstruck hearing the Yiddish language in all its splendor and radiance, and called upon Goldfaden to create similar theaters in Warsaw, Lublin, Vilna, Berdachev, and Balta, while Yiddish theater was an immediate hit with the broad masses of Jews, was generally liked and admired by Jewish intellectuals and many Gentile intellectuals, a small but socially powerful portion of the Jewish community, centered among Orthodox and Hasidic Jews remained opposed to it. Besides complaints about the mingling of men and women in public and about the use of music and dance outside of sacred contexts, the two main criticisms from this quarter were one, that the Yiddish jargon was being promoted to the detriment of proper Hebrew and two, that satire against Hasidim and others would not necessarily be understood as satire and would make Jews look ridiculous. 
Berkovici quotes an anonymous 1885 article as responding to these criticisms by saying one, that all Jews speak some modern language and why should Yiddish be any more detrimental to Hebrew than Romanian, Russian, or German, and two, that the Gentiles who would come to Yiddish theater would not be the antisemites, they would be those who already knew and liked Jews, and that they would recognize satire for what it was, adding that these criticisms were nothing. When weighed against the education that Yiddish theatre was bringing to the lower classes, writing of Sigmund Mogulesco's troop in Romania in 1884, and probably referring to the plays of Moses Horowitz and Joseph Latiner, Moses Gaster wrote that Yiddish theatre represents scenes from our history known by only a tiny minority, refreshing, therefore, secular memory and shows us our defects, which we have like all men, but not with a tendency to strike at our own immorality with a tendency towards ill will, but only with an ironic spirit that does not wound us, as we are wounded by representations on other stages, where the Jew plays a degrading role. Goldfaden S. plays ultimately formed a canon of Yiddish theatre, and were performed continuously for over fifty years. In the theatre world, they were reverently regarded as a kind of Torah from Sinai, and the characters of the plays permeated Jewish cultural life over several generations. <inaudible> Yiddish theatre in Russia If Yiddish theatre was born in Romania, its youth occurred in Imperial Russia, largely in what is now Ukraine. Israel Rosenberg's troupe, which later had a series of managers, including Goldfaden, S. brother Tulia, and which at one point split in two, with one half led by actor Jacob Adler, gave Russia's first professional Yiddish theater performance in Odessa in 1878. Goldfaden himself soon came to Odessa, pushing Rosenberg's troupe into the provinces, and OSIP Mikhailovich Lerner and N.M. Shikovich also founded a Yiddish theater at Odessa, which for several years became the capital of Yiddish theater. Russia offered a more sophisticated audience than rural Romania. Many Russian Jews were regular attendees of Russian language theater, and Odessa was a first rate theater city. In this context, serious melodramatic operettas, and even straight plays, took their place in the repertoire among the lighter vaudevilles and comedies that had thus far predominated. All three major troops in Odessa did their own productions of Karl Gutzko's play Uriel Acosta with Goldfaden's production being an operetta. However, even this increased sophistication could not compare to later, more ambitious efforts of the Yiddish theater. Looking back on this period, although acknowledging certain of Goldfaden's plays from this era as masterpieces, Jacob Adler saw this as a period of relative mediocrity compared to what came later. For three years I Wandered in the cave of the witch and the motley of Schmendrick and what did I really know of my trade? He describes himself as thinking in 1883, If someday I return to Yiddish theatre let me at least not be so ignorant. Much of the theatre performed during this period was later referred to as shunned, or trash, though critics such as Itzik Manger felt it possessed a naive energy and was unfairly maligned. What seemed, for a time, a boundless future in Russia was cut short by the anti Jewish reaction following the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. Yiddish theatre was banned, under an order effective September 14, 1883. This ban caused an exodus of Yiddish actors and playwrights to other countries, Poland, in particular, where they had the freedom to perform. The Moscow Yiddish Theater, or Jewish Kamerny Theater in Moscow, or New Yiddish Chamber Theater, directed by Alexei Granovsky, and with contributors including Mark Chagall, was founded in Petrograd in June 1919 as an experimental workshop then became the Moscow State Jewish Theater. Yiddish theatre in London Topic. Of the next era of Yiddish theatre, Adler wrote, Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 if Yiddish theatre was destined to go through its infancy in Russia, and in America grew to manhood and success, then London was its school. In London in the 1880s, playing in small theatre clubs, on a stage the size of a cadaver, not daring to play on a Friday night or to light a fire on stage on a Saturday afternoon both because of the Jewish Sabbath, forced to use a cardboard ram's horn when playing Uriel Acosta so as not to blaspheme, Yiddish theatre nonetheless took on much of what was best in European theatrical tradition. 
In this period, the plays of Schiller first entered the repertoire of Yiddish theatre, beginning with The Robbers, the start of a vogue that would last a quarter of a century. Adler records that, like Shakespeare, Schiller was revered by the broad Jewish public, not just by intellectuals, admired for his almost socialist view of society. Although his plays were often radically adapted for the Yiddish stage, shortening them and dropping Christian, anti-Semitic, and classical mythological references there were several smaller Jewish theatre groups in Manchester and Glasgow. <inaudible> <inaudible> Yiddish theatre in Poland Poland was an important centre of Yiddish theatrical activity, with more than 400 Yiddish theatrical companies performing in the country during the interwar period. One of the most important companies, the avant-garde Vilna Troupe Vilna Troupe, formed in Vilna, as its name suggests, but moved to Warsaw in 1917. The Vilna Troupe employed some of the most accomplished actors on the Yiddish stage, including Avram Morevsky, who played the Maropoli or Sadik in the first performance of the Dybbuk, and Joseph Buloff, who was the lead actor of the Vilna Troupe and went on to further accomplishments with Maurice Schwartz's Yiddish Art Theatre in New York. It was in Warsaw that the Vilna Troupe staged the first performance of the Dybbuk in 1920, a play that made a profound and lasting impression on Yiddish theatre and world culture. The Vilna Troupe inspired the creation of more avant-garde and ambitious Yiddish theatrical companies, including the Warsaw Yiddish Art Theater, founded by Zygmunt Turkow and Ida Kaminska in 1924, the Warsaw New Yiddish Theater, founded by Jonas Turkow in 1929, and the Young Theater, founded by Michal Weikert in 1932. In addition to the serious artistic efforts of the art theaters, cabaret flourished in Poland during the interwar period, combining musical performances with stand-up comedy. The most celebrated practitioners of this kind of performance were Shimon Jigen and Yisrael Shumasher, who began their lifelong Yiddish comedy career at the theater Ararat in Lodz in 1927. Puppet and marionette theater also attained great artistic significance, often staging satirical shows on contemporary social issues. Yiddish theater in Poland reflected the political preoccupations of its time. They struggled financially, like all Jewish cultural institutions during that period, even while flourishing for a time during a more liberal political atmosphere. Actors and directors, just like others during that period, were highly aware of labor relations, and tried to create egalitarian working relationships. Organizations such as the Yiddish Actors' Union, based in Warsaw, played a crucial role in providing a forum for theater professionals to discuss these issues and try new solutions, such as collectively run theaters. Theatrical performances themselves also addressed social issues. Michal Weikert's Young Teeter was particularly known for political engagement, staging an attention-getting avant-garde performance of the play Boston, by Bernhard Bloom, about the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti, in 1933. <laughs> Yiddish theater in the Americas the 1883 Russian ban on Yiddish theater lifted in 1904 effectively pushed it to Western Europe and then to America. Over the next few decades, successive waves of Yiddish performers arrived in New York and, to a lesser extent, in Berlin, London, Vienna, and Paris, some simply as artists seeking an audience, but many as a result of persecutions, pogroms and economic crises in Eastern Europe. Professional Yiddish theatre in London began in 1884, and flourished until the mid-1930s. By 1896, Kalman Juvelier's troupe was the only one that remained in Romania, where Yiddish theatre had started, although Mogulesco sparked a revival there in 1906. There was also some activity in Warsaw and Lvov, which were under Austrian rather than Russian rule. In this era, Yiddish theatre existed almost entirely on stage, rather than in texts. The Jewish Encyclopedia of 1901-1906 reported, "...there are probably less than 50 printed Yiddish dramas, and the entire number of written dramas of which there is any record hardly exceeds 500. Of these at least nine-tenths are translations or adaptations." Beginning in 1882 and throughout the 1880s and 1890s, amateur theatrical companies presented Yiddish productions in New York City, leading to regular weekend performances at theaters such as the Bowery Garden, the National and the Talia, with unknowns such as Boris Tomaszewski emerging as stars. The Talia Theater sought to change the material of the Yiddish stage to better reform the material that was being produced. 
The reformers of the Yiddish stage, Jacob Gordon later explained, wanted to utilize the theatre for higher purposes, to derive from it not only amusement, but education. Jacob Gordon himself had numerous times tried to get his plays onto the Windsor stage without luck. Gordon successfully challenged Latiner and Hurwitz in 1891 to 1892 when he entered the Yiddish theater with an avowed purpose of reforming Yiddish drama rather than pandering to the public's taste for cheap shun trash plays he sought to secure goodwill of the East Side's intelligentsia with literature and increasingly incorporated the concepts of true art and serious drama into their public image Professional companies soon developed and flourished, so that between 1890 and 1940, there were over 200 Yiddish theaters or touring Yiddish theater troops in the United States. At many times, a dozen Yiddish theater groups existed in New York City alone, with the Yiddish Theater District, sometimes referred to as the Jewish Rialto, centered on Second Avenue in what is now the East Village, but was then considered part of the Jewish Lower East Side, which often rivaled Broadway in scale and quality. At the time the U.S. entered World War I, there were 22 Yiddish theaters and two Yiddish vaudeville houses in New York City alone. Original plays, musicals, and even translations of Hamlet and Richard Wagner's operas were performed, both in the United States and Eastern Europe during this period. Yiddish theater is said to have two artistic golden ages, the first in the realistic plays produced in New York City in the late 19th century, and the second in the political and artistic plays written and performed in Russia and New York in the 1920s. Professional Yiddish theater in New York began in 1886 with a troupe founded by Zygmunt Mogulesko. At the time of Goldfaden's funeral in 1908, the New York Times wrote, "...the dense Jewish population on the Lower East Side of Manhattan shows in its appreciation of its own humble Yiddish poetry and the drama much the same spirit that controlled the rough audiences of the Elizabethan theater." There, as in the London of the 16th century, is a veritable intellectual renaissance." Jacob Dinez quipped, "...the still young Yiddish theatre that went to America did not recognize its father just three or four years later, nor would it obey or come when called." Responding in a letter to Dinez, Goldfaden wrote, I do not have any complaints about the American Yiddish theatre not recognizing its father. It is not rare that children do not recognize their parents, or even that the parents cannot travel the road their children have gone. But I do have complaints, though I do not know to whom, that my dear Jewish child is growing up to be a coarse, un-Jewish, insolent boor, and I expect that some day I will be cursed for that very thing that I brought into the world. Here in America, it has thrown all shame aside and not only is it not learning anything, it has forgotten whatever good it used to know." In February 1902, Jewish builder and philanthropist Harry Finchel bought a piece of land of about 10,000 square feet, at the south corner of Grand and Christie Streets with the intention to erect on the site a theater for Yiddish performances, at the time of the opening of the Grand Theater in New York 1903, New York. S first purpose built Yiddish theater. The New York Times noted that the Yiddish population as composed of confirmed theater goers has been evident for a long time, and for many years at least three theaters, which had served their day of usefulness for the English dramas, have been pressed into service, providing amusement for the people of the ghetto. In fact, this was a tremendous understatement of what was going on in Yiddish theater at the time. Around the same time, Lincoln Steffens wrote that the theatre being played at the time in Yiddish outshone what was being played in English. Yiddish New York theatregoers were familiar with the plays of Ibsen, Tolstoy, and even Shaw long before these works played on Broadway, and the high caliber of Yiddish language acting became clear as Yiddish actors began to cross over to Broadway, first with Jacob Adler. S. Tour de Force performance as Shylock in a 1903 production of The Merchant of Venice, but also with performers such as Bertha Kallick, who moved back and forth between the city's leading Yiddish language and English language stages. Nina Warnke wrote, in his memoirs, A. Mukdoni summed up the ambivalent feelings Russian Jewish intellectuals had about the influx of American plays and players onto their soil on the eve of the war. The American repertoire be it the good or bad one and the American actors be they the good or bad ones, 
made us realize that the Yiddish theater is really in America and that here in Poland and Russia the Yiddish theater lives off the fallen crumbs that it collects under the rich American table." Mukdoiny was certainly correct in realizing that the center of Yiddish theatrical production was in New York, and that Poland was turning into its cultural colony. This theatrical expansion eastward, which had begun slowly in the 1890s because of the great need in Eastern Europe to fill the vacuum of repertoire, turned into a conscious American export item during the 1910s. At that time, the immigrant community in New York as a whole, and the Yiddish theater in particular, had matured, and they were confident enough of their power and unique status to begin to actively seek acknowledgement, accolades, and financial gain beyond the local and regional spheres. The war would only briefly interrupt this emerging trend. What Clara Young was one of the first to discover, actors such as Molly Picone and Ludwig Satz would realize during the interwar period, Poland offered not only a lucrative market for American Yiddish actors, but also an environment where up-and-coming performers could more easily achieve a career breakthrough than in New York. In the early years of immigration, Eastern Europe had served as a necessary recruitment pool to feed the American Yiddish theater with new stage talent. Shortly before World War I, it began to provide new audiences and marketing possibilities for the creative energies that had gathered in New York. Some of the most important Yiddish playwrights of the first era included, Jacob Gordon 1853-1909, known for plays such as The Yiddish King Lear and for his translations and adaptations of Tolstoy, Solomon Libin 1872-1955, David Pinsky 1872-1959, and Leon Cobrin 1872-1946. This first golden age of Yiddish drama in America ended when the period from 1905 to 1908 brought half a million new Jewish immigrants to New York. Once again, as in the 1880s, the largest audience for Yiddish theater was for lighter fare. The Adlers and Kenny Lipson hung on doing classic theater, but Boris and Bessie Tomaszewski returned to the earlier style, making a fortune off of what the Adlers despised as shunned, trash, theater. Plays like Joseph Latiner. S. The Jewish Heart succeeded at this time, while Gordon's late plays like Dementia Americana 1909 were initially commercial failures. It would be 1911 before the trend was reversed, with Adler's commercially successful production of Tolstoy's The Living Corpse also known as Redemption, translated into Yiddish by Kabrin. Both the more and the less serious Yiddish theater persisted. As Lula Rosenfeld writes, Art and shunned alike would find their audience. The Yiddish theater continued to have its ups and downs. In 1918, Isaac Goldberg could look around himself and reasonably write that. The Yiddish stage, despite the fact that it has produced its greatest dramatists only yesterday, is already, despite its financial successes, next door to extinction. Quote, as it happens, it was on the dawn of a second era of greatness. A 1925 New York Times article asserts that the Yiddish theater has been thoroughly Americanized. It is now a stable American institution and no longer dependent on immigration from Eastern Europe. People who can neither speak nor write Yiddish attend Yiddish stage performances and pay Broadway prices on Second Avenue. Quote, this is attributed to the fact that Yiddish theater is only one of the expressions of a New York Jewish cultural life. In full flower, famous plays of this second golden era were the Dybbuk 1919, by S. Ansky, considered a revolutionary play in both Yiddish and mainstream theater. It has been translated into many languages and performed thousands of times all over the world, on stage and on television. There have been several movies. It is now regarded as the crown jewel of the Jewish theater. Operas, ballets, symphonic suites and other musical compositions have been based on the Dybbuk. In earlier years it was considered so significant that parodies about the Dybbuk were written and performed in Europe and the United States, and Sky wrote a number of other plays, four of which are included in his Gesemelt Schriften, long out of print. One, Day and Night, is, like the Dybbuk, a Hasidic Gothic story. The other three plays have revolutionary themes, and were originally written in Russian, Father and Son, in a conspiratorial apartment, and The Grandfather, all four have recently been republished in a bilingual Yiddish-English edition. Also notable are The Golem by H. Levick as well as the plays of Sholem Aleichem. Buenos Aires, Argentina figured prominently in Yiddish theater between the wars. 
While pre war Yiddish theatre in Argentina had bordered on burlesque, shortly after World War I, Tomaszewski and others brought their companies to Buenos Aires for the offseason when New York theatres were closed for the summer. The Argentine winter. According to Michael Terry, Buenos Aires experienced a golden age of Yiddish theatre in the 1930s and 1940s, becoming the second city of the world history of Yiddish theatre. There were also theatre performances in Yiddish in many Brazilian cities. Yiddish theatre after the Second World War was revived with the writing and performance of the Warsaw Ghetto. Several of America's most influential 20th century acting teachers, such as Stella Adler, daughter of Jacob and Sarah Adler and sister of actor Luther Adler, and Lee Strasberg, had their first tastes of theatre in Yiddish. Though some of the methods developed by them and other members of the group theater were reactions to the often melodramatic and larger-than-life style of Yiddish theater, this style nonetheless informed their theories and left its stamp on them. Yiddish theater was also highly influential on what is still known as Jewish humor. <laughs> Post-Holocaust Yiddish theater like the rest of Yiddish language culture, Yiddish theater was devastated by the Holocaust. Most of the world's Yiddish speakers were killed and many theaters were destroyed. Many of the surviving Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazim emigrated to Israel, where many assimilated into the emerging Hebrew language culture, since Yiddish was discouraged and looked down upon by Zionists. In Soviet Union, the Moscow State Jewish Theater continued to perform until 1948, when it was shut down. Although its glory days have passed, Yiddish theater companies still perform in various Jewish communities. The Folksbean People's Theater Company in New York City is still active 90 years after it was founded. New Yiddish Rep, founded in New York City in 2007, has been very successful at producing Yiddish shows for a younger audience than the senior citizen-oriented Folksbean. The Dora Wasserman Yiddish Theater of Montreal, Quebec, Canada has been active since 1958. The Esther Rachel and Ida Kaminska Jewish Theater in Warsaw, Poland and the State Jewish Theater in Bucharest, Romania also continue to perform plays in Yiddish, with simultaneous translations into Polish and Romanian respectively. Although Yiddish theater never truly caught on in the state of Israel, the Yiddishpiel Theater Company founded in 1987 is still producing and performing new plays in Tel Aviv. The longest-running Yiddish production in Israel, which was also one of the few commercial Yiddish theatrical successes post-Holocaust, was Pesach Burstein's production of Itzik Manger's Songs of the Megala Yiddish, Megal Leader. It also released on Broadway in 1968 to favorable reviews as Megillah of Itzik Manger. The career of the Burstein troupe has recently been documented in the documentary film The Comediant. Opera singer and actor David Serrero is bringing Yiddish theater, adapted in English, back to the Lower East Side of New York, with plays such as the Yiddish King Lear. In popular culture The 1987 musical on Second Avenue is an off-Broadway musical and looks back at Yiddish theater on New York's Second Avenue. It had a successful revival in 2005, with a cast led by Mike Burston, and was nominated for two Drama Desk Awards. One of Alan Menken's first musicals, the C.1974 Dear Worthy Editor, was based on the letters to the editor of Jewish American newspaper Daily Jewish Forward, featuring the struggles of Eastern European Jews from the turn of the century as they tried to assimilate while hold on to their culture. See also Topic. Topic. References. Topic. Notes. Bibliography. Actors Own New Theater. New York Times, February 8, 1903, 32. This article also reviews a production of Latainer's melodrama Zion, or On the Rivers of Babylon at the Grand Theater, and gives a quick survey of the history and character of Yiddish theater and its audience in New York at that time. Burial of a Yiddish Poet. New York Times, January 12, 1908, 8. Partial list of plays by Goldfaden, the names are useful, but some of the dates are certainly incorrect. Retrieved January 11, 2005. Note, this list contains fewer than half of Goldfaden's plays, and many of the names as well as dates are incorrect. 
Adler, Jacob, A Life on the Stage, a Memoir, translated and with commentary by Lula Rosenfeld, Knopf, New York, 1999, ISBN 0-679-41351-0. Berkovici, Israel equals Berkovich, Israel, O Suta de Ani de Titru Evriesk in Romania. 100 Years of Yiddish, Jewish Theatre in Romania. Second Romanian Language Edition, revised and augmented by Constantine Makuica. Editora Integral an imprint of Editorial Universala, Bucharest 1998. ISBN 973-98272-2-5. Snippet preview on Google Books. This edition is based on Berkovici's own 1982 Romanian translation of his originally Yiddish language work Hundert Your Yiddish Teeter in Rumanie, 1876 1976, published in 1976. Berkovich, Yisrael, Hundert Your Yiddish Teeter in Rumanie, 1876 1976. Bucharest, Criterion, 1976, full text via the Internet Archive. Berkowitz, Joel. Avram Goldfaden and the Modern Yiddish Theatre, The Bard of Old Constantine. PDF, PAKN Trigger, No. 44, Winter 2004, 10-19, gives a good sketch of Goldfaden's career, and also discusses 20th-century approaches to the Goldfadenian repertoire. Berkowitz, Joel, Shakespeare on the American Yiddish Stage. Iowa City, University of Iowa Press, 2002. Berkowitz, Joel, ed., Yiddish Theatre, New Approaches. London, Litman Library of Jewish Civilization, 2003. Chira, Susan. 100 Years of Yiddish Theatre Celebrated. New York Times, October 15, 1982, c. 28. Goldberg, Isaac, New York's Yiddish Writers in the Bookman, Vol. 46 684-689, Dodd, Mead and Company, New York, 1918. Melamed, S. M., The Yiddish Stage, New York Times, September 27, 1925 X2, Penulosa, Fernando. The Dybbuk, Text, Subtext, and Context. Ciderboim Books, 2012. Penulosa, Fernando, T. R. Parodies of Enskice The Dybbuk, Bilingual Edition. Ciderboim Books, 2012. And Sky, S. Four Plays, Bilingual Edition, T. R. Fernando Penulosa. Ciderboim Books, 2013. Sandro, Nama, Vagabond Stars, A World History of Yiddish Theatre. Harper and Rowe, 1977, reissued by Syracuse University Press, 1995. Sandro, Nama, The Father of Yiddish Theatre, Zamir, Autumn 2003 PDF, 9-15. This publication from the Zamir Chorale of Boston contains numerous articles on topics related to Yiddish theatre. Wiernick, Peter, and Richard Gothile. Jewish Encyclopedia. Volume 4. New York, Funk and Wagnalls, 1903. p. 653-654. Online version Jewish Encyclopedia 1901-1906 External links Topic. Jewish Theater in Vilna in the interwar period on the Yad Vashem website New Yiddish Rep Overview of Yiddish Theater Yiddish Theater in America California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language Yiddishpiel Theater in Tel Aviv Folksbean Yiddish Theater in London, online exhibition of the Jewish Museum, London National Jewish Theater in Warsaw Dora Wasserman Yiddish Theater, Siegel Center for Performing Arts Yiddish Theater Placards Collection at the New York Public Library, including items from New York and Buenos Aires Yiddish Research Bibliography and Guide at the New York Public Library Contemporary Posters, Jewish Theater Posters Yivo Encyclopedia Entry on Yiddish Theater Finding Aid for the Records of the Yiddisher Artist and Farain at the Center for Jewish History Finding Aid for the Collection on Yiddish Theater at the Museum of the City of New York